Okay, we'll get started. Uh, welcome all, and thank you for joining today's uh, AWRI webinar. My name's Jeff Cowie, and I'm a senior oenologist at the AWRI. In the spirit of reconciliation, the AWRI acknowledges the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and their connections to the land, the sea, and the community. And we pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples today. Uh, in today's session, we're going to look at smoke testing, what do labs actually measure, and new ways to speed it up. Um, but before we make a start, um, a couple of quick reminders. Um, so if you're new to AWRA webinars and you want to provide a comment, ask a question, um, you can do so anytime throughout the webinar. Um, just click on the Q&A button uh, on the Zoom toolbar, type in your question, uh, click send to send it through. Um, we'll be holding with this webinar a Q&A session at the end, um, so we'll address those questions then, but you can send a question at any time. Um, a quick reminder that we are recording the session. We've uh, started that already. Um, at the end of the webinar, you'll be emailed a link to view the recording on the AWRI's YouTube channel. Uh, so for anyone who's just joined, welcome. Uh, today's webinar topic is smoke testing, what do labs actually measure and new ways to speed it up. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome Neil Scrimger from AWRI Commercial Service. Uh, so Neil is a senior project scientist and he manages the project team within the AWRI commercial services. Um, so that role involves looking at lots of different types of projects, including things like closure trials, shelf life trials, testing new equipment, maybe new processes um, and technologies. Um, and during the 2019-20 season um, and harvest, uh, Neil um, looked into the development of a rapid screening tool um, to measure smoke taint. Um, and he's gonna give us a summary of that today. Um, Neil, if you're ready to make a start, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, I can hear you. Just share my screen. Can, can you see that? I can. Perfect. Excellent. Good to go. Good to go. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, if you're in the Eastern States, I guess it's good afternoon. I, um, as Jeff said, going to talk about a rapid analysis method that we uh, developed um, during the early part of 2020. Uh, for screening smoke affected grapes and wine. Uh, we focused really on grapes to try and have the biggest bang for buck in terms of um, potential value. But um, I'll talk through some of the, the work we've done to develop that method. But there's also some background information on the reference methods we use for analysis. And some of you may have seen some of these slides from the National Bushfire Conference it was held a few months ago, um, but I've got a few slides on just understanding the methodology um, that supports the rapid method. So I think we're all now incidents of uncontrolled bushfires is increasing worldwide. Um, as a result of that, there is a risk to grapevines from smoke exposure. It's an issue that the wine industry has been facing for a while. Um, and it's progressively being forced to address it in different ways, estimated to cost the industry billions and billions of dollars. Um, when grapes are exposed to smoke, it can result in the development of wines with undesirable sensory characteristics like smoky, um, ashtray, medicinal characters, depending on the level of smoke exposure, smoke composition, style and variety of wine, a number of other things. There's obviously a lot of research um, ongoing into smoke prevention and protection from for grapes in the vineyard. <clears throat> um, and there's a lot of work ongoing around uh, mitigation um, for juices and wines uh, with things like activated carbon treatments. If fruits exposed to smoke, um, it can be be a very costly exercise to understand the degree of impact on the grapes, both chemically 
and sensorially. So having access to a rapid screen method um, that will allow us to assess the level of smoke exposure uh, in the grapes would be invaluable. So I'll just go into a bit of background on the, the analytical chemistry involved here. So the compounds in smoke primarily responsible for the attributes that I've described are volatile phenols. Um, they produce when wood is burnt or um, different fuel sources um, are burnt. The, these compounds can be absorbed directly by the grapes, the leaves and the stems, and they can bind to sugar compounds in the grapes to produce what we call glycosides, and they, they have no direct smoky aroma. Um, now there's a multitude of different glycosides that can form. Uh, our analytical methods for quantifying smoke exposure include both the volatile and the, the bound forms, which are the glycosides. Most labs um, would include a core set of seven volatile phenols, and I'll talk through those shortly. As I said, there are potentially dozens and dozens of glycosides um, that can be formed, which includes monosaccharides and um, an array of disaccharides. The ones we focus on are our six core compounds that we've seen reflect smoke exposure in, in grapes. And I'll, again, I'll talk through those um, in detail as we move forward. So the testing of grapes or wine for evidence of smoke exposure involves fairly sophisticated and often expensive analytical techniques. Um, so we're talking gas chromatography or liquid chromatography coupled with mass spectroscopy. So it's, um, yeah, very expensive equipment, takes a lot of expertise to run. Um, and we use a combination of these techniques to separately determine the concentration of the individual volatile phenols and glycosides. Now, there are some differences between um, different labs in the way in which they analyze these compounds. Generally, the marker compounds we look for are the same, but the way in which they're analyzed can result in some differences in the absolute values. Generally speaking, volatiles are measured in the same way, and that's GC mass spec. Um, and that's it's still an involved process, it's still expensive equipment, but most labs would generally apply that sort of technology. The glycoside measurement, on the other hand, is a little bit different. Um, there are a couple of different ways to approach it, and I've highlighted these on screen here. Um, the example on the left is what we call the hydrolysis method, um, and this essentially cleaves the sugar compounds um, from the volatiles, and then we measure the volatiles that are remaining. And again, that's using GC mass spec. Uh, the right hand side is um, a, an alternative approach using liquid chromatography with mass spec. And this actually separates and quantifies the band components as a whole. So it doesn't, there's no cleaving of the, um, the sugar band to the volatile phenol. So we're trying to measure the same things here, but the, the approach we use is slightly different and different labs will use a different approach depending on um, the history of the lab, the equipment they've got available, internal expertise, and a number of other things. Um, so because we've got this difference, we can see a difference in the concentration of the bound compounds. Um, as the hydrolysis method infers the concentration from the free forms. So what I mean by that is an example would be guaiacol measured by the hydrolysis method um, isn't necessarily just due to one guaiacol sugar and compound. It may be from a variety of different guaiacol um, forms. So there can be monoglycoside, um, there'll be uh, what we call gentiobiocide, um, pentioglucose, um, rutinicide, there's a whole range of sugars that can be bound to guaiacol. So detecting guaiacol by the hydrolysis method doesn't really give you the right information in terms of which compound you're actually looking at because it's already broken down. So the preparation analysis conditions can affect the degree of hydrolysis and the corresponding values. So what that means essentially is the range of concentrations we see with labs using the hydrolysis method 
can be higher than the range of concentrations we see when the LCMS method has been used. Now, <clears throat> the main reason we're looking at smoke compounds is obviously because of the sensory impact they can have. So all of these compounds, and these are the, these are the free form volatiles I've got on screen here, they've all got negative attributes for wine, um, unless they're there in very, very small quantities, um, there'll be negative attributes um, associated with these compounds being present. And you can see from the numbers, the sensory aroma thresholds, they're all relatively low, bar a couple, um, and they're all reasonably um, consistent. It doesn't take much of these compounds to be present to have an impact on the aroma or flavor of the wine. Now, glycosides don't have any direct smoky aroma, but they do break down during fermentation and they can also break down over time in bottle or in barrel, um, releasing the volatile phenols. So that cleaving of the sugar compounds can happen during fermentation and during aging. Um, and studies have shown that enzymes in the mouth, in saliva, can also have an impact on these compounds. So again, those enzymes are capable, in some cases, of cleaving the sugar from the volatiles, leaving that smoky, ashy taste in the mouth. So for today's purposes, I'm not going to go into the sensory impact too much. I'm going to focus more on the chemical impact of smoke and how we can potentially screen the degree of impact that we see chemically. I'm not going to try to link that to what it means sensorially, because that's a whole different um, body of work. And there's still research on ongoing to understand those links between chemical and sensory data. Um, the other complicated factor is the sensory impact is also dependent on a number of factors, not just the concentration that is present, but also a variety, wine style, um, the compound profile itself, and the sensitivity of tasters as well. So when we look at smoke exposed or at risk grapes and wine, we look at these kind of compounds. So the seven at the top are the free um, volatile phenols and the six underneath are the, the key marker compounds for glycosides that we, we look at. And this allows us to understand the degree of impact we've seen from smoke. Now, one issue with all of this is that these compounds can be present naturally in grapes and consequently in wine, even when smoke hasn't been present. So in order to provide some sort of meaningful comparison for the data and provide some sort of context, we need to understand what the typical background levels are um, in grapes and wine, and that will differ by variety. So over many years, we've built up a lot of background data to understand what these background levels look like. So we've used grapes sourced from all over the country, different regions, different varieties, and then applied a standard winemaking protocol to understand what that does to the level of the volatile phenols and the glycosides that are naturally present when smoke isn't around. And that gives us a reference point for interpretation when we receive samples from a producer. So it typically guides the interpretation process. Um, the example here we've given is for Shiraz grapes, which generally have a, a higher proportion of background volatile phenols and glycosides than most varieties. Um, the bars you can see on the top graph, they represent the 99th percentile for our background data. Um, so we've removed some of the outliers from that data set. And the individual points you can see overlaid on the bars represents the samples in this case. So for something like guacol, the background level in Shiraz sits at around six micrograms per kilogram. These three samples here are all within that background range. So we'd say they look fairly typical or normal. Um, and there's no obvious indication that smoke's had an impact in this particular case. If you look at the data at the bottom of the screen for the glycosides, 
it's actually hard to make out some of the bars. They are right there at the bottom of the graph, but you can see that most of those data points sit, um, in some cases, well beyond the top of those bars. And that basically tells us that there's uh, an abnormal level of glycosides present in these samples. And there is certainly a strong indication that smoke may have played a role in that. Um, something like syringol, certainly last year with the 2019-2020 fires, we saw that particular compound um, significantly higher than background levels and, and tended to dominate the, the smoke glycoside profile as well. So this is the summary of background levels we see for all the marker compounds. Uh, this data on the screen is for grapes. So we've got the volatiles over on the left-hand side and we've got the glycosides on the right. And you can see that um, the total concentration uh, in terms of background levels can be different by variety. There's not a massive difference, but um, there, there is a difference non, nonetheless. It tends to be a little bit more obvious with the volatile phenols than it is, sorry, with the glycosides than it is with the volatile phenols. Um, and the profile um, can be a little bit different. So with some varieties, cresols, for example, are more important than things like guacol and syringol. This is the background level we saw in the wines. Um, again, very similar trends to the background data we saw in the grapes. Again, Shiraz is particularly high, um, but again, the profiles differ, differ by, by variety. Um, and it's a, a bit of an ongoing process for us to update and maintain this data so that it's always relevant. Um, there is an ongoing process at the moment to add other varietals into the mix beyond the ones we can see on screen. And we've been able to access some funding programs to actually allow us to add more varieties into the mix so that the interpretation of the data can be more meaningful and more targeted. So just wrapping up the, um, the last few slides in terms of the different methods, generally volatile results between commercial labs are quite consistent and they're quite comparable across labs. Um, the same is not true for the bound compounds. So with glycosides, it is very heavily dependent on the method that's been used, whether it's the hydrolysis method or the direct measurement or the LCMS. Um, it is important to look at both free and bound. So in its terms of interpretation, with especially with the bound data, it's important that any comparison to background data and any comparisons made across time between vintages across varieties are made using data that's been generated using the same method. So it's not really possible to make direct comparisons between labs that are using different methods. The absolute numbers just aren't comparable. Um, otherwise you'd be making um, interpretations and the, the information you're using to make those interpretations and conclusions on the grapes and the wine can be flawed. Um, but it's important to understand that there are some of those differences between labs and the way in which they analyze the data. So I've talked about the analytical methods um, we use that they are um, highly technical, they need a high level of expertise, um, they generally can't be applied in real time. It, it does take um, several days to turn around a sample, um, put it through an extraction process, run the analysis, process the data, report that, and run an interpretation on the top of it. Um, and when we have unprecedented events like we did in 2020, that turnaround time can be significant. So having a rapid screening test that we can use to determine the extent of impact from smoke exposure, like I say, will be extremely valuable the whole wine industry. Um, and we're seeing this crop up um, quite a lot in the media at the moment around antigen testing for things like COVID. Um, you know, what, what is the value in having a rapid screening test? It's results within a few minutes rather than days and days. It gives you an idea to know what the current status of your, your grapes 
uh, um, and the potential infection level from smoke. With the right equipment, you can administer the test yourself. Uh, it's much cheaper, faster turnaround. Um, you don't need that degree of sophistication and equipment or labor to run a test. Real-time results, and, and you immediately know the potential level of risk. So there's a lot of benefits to having a rapid screening method. The key thing for us is to make sure that whatever we develop is robust and reliable. And like with COVID testing, we need to manage the potential risk from false positives and false negatives. So probably in this instance, false negatives for us are a bigger issue where a rapid screening test suggests there's no risk from smoke or no exposure level. And the reality is that there is evidence of smoke there. So reducing or completely um, getting rid of incidents of false negatives is a big push for this type of method. So there are a number of parallel studies being run at the moment using fairly high-end technology. Now Adelaide University have been looking at um, fluorescent spectroscopy. Metabolomics Australia have done a small study around the use of NMR. Um, we focused our study on um, Fourier transform infrared um, using the Brooker instrument that's at the top left of the screen. Um, the reason for this is it's a small, fairly inexpensive portable unit. Um, there's no sample prep required. Um, analysis is quick and easy. You get a result within about 30 seconds. So this, this kind of tech's been used to um, develop analytical methods for various analytes across the years. It's got a fairly broad application for chemical attributes in grapes, juices, and wines. And like I said, it's got a very quick um, turnaround in terms of testing time. Um, and we thought this was a good candidate for trialing um, the development of a rapid assessment method um, for smoke exposed grapes and wine. So the spectra we get basically contain differences that directly relate to some of the smoke related compounds that are present in the samples. Um, we do need to use fairly sophisticated stats techniques to understand those differences and model them so that we can then um, understand the degree of risk from smoke. But that, that can be um, automated to an extent into the sample analysis procedure. So in terms of how we'd like to adopt a rapid screening method, this, this is a um, I guess uh, an ideal scenario for someone that's potentially got a problem when bushfires do exist. We, we apply a rapid screening test up front. Um, if we've got something that's robust and reliable and it indicates a low exposure level, potentially we don't need to do any further testing. Um, small scale fermentation, which we always recommend as a check for potential level of risk might be something you can do. Um, it would certainly be a step that you go through if the initial screening suggested a medium level of exposure to smoke. Um, and that small scale ferment might be a good way to understand whether the impact is likely to be low or high, because you will get an indication of um, sensory impact from that, not just chemical. Obviously, if the rapid screening suggests it's a high impact level, um, you might want to do some confirmation or um, testing again a small scale ferment would probably be enough to prove that there is there has been a high impact from smoke and you probably don't need to do any further um, expensive and elaborate chemical and sensory profiling unless it's particularly high value parcel of fruit so there's different ways to approach that but the ideal scenario would be this rapid test allows us to shortcut some of these routes and limit the amount of expensive testing we do at the end of the day. So during early part of 2020, we took a series of grape and wine samples collected across the vintage. Again, we used a number of um, samples from different regions across Australia. Um, we expected the mix of samples we received to contain um, a lot of samples that were high risk because they were uh, close proximity to bushfires. 
but also a lot that were sent in for um, peace of mind testing, if nothing else, fairly low exposure, but producers wanted to check that that was the case. So it actually gave us a reasonably well um, mixed and varied sample set to work with. So each of these samples was assessed using the infrared technique. Um, we also put each one through the corresponding reference analysis. So the, for us, the GCMS uh, method for the volatiles and the LCMS, LCMS method for the glycosides. Um, and then we feed that information back into the model along with the spectral data to understand how well we can see the degree of impact from smoke. Um, I don't have any data on varieties, but most of what we dealt with was Shiraz, Chardonnay and Pinot. They probably made up um, about three quarters, 80% of the samples we received. Um, but there was a really good mix of um, lots of different varieties in there. Now, in terms of the modeling, we looked at both a quantitative and a qualitative approach. And it's always important when we're developing a rapid method like this, especially when it involves a spectral technique to split the data set into a separate calibration and validation set. So the idea there is that you use one set to build a model that looks like it's robust and then use the independent set that you put aside for the validation to actually prove that the model you've built is reliable and the accuracy is as you would like. Um, we split our test sets roughly uh, 75, 25. So three quarters of the set was used to build the calibration model and 25% was used to actually test its performance in validation. Now, generally speaking, the absolute concentrations of the individual compounds we're dealing with are extremely low compared to some of the other grape and wine analytes that have been modeled with this kind of technique. And for that reason, we thought that being able to quantify individual compounds is probably quite unlikely, but there was a potential for us to model against um, potentially the sum of the volatiles or the sum of the glycosides present in each sample. Um, I've included syringeol gentibicide in this because out of all of the compounds we saw, that was probably the most dominant um, individual compound in probably 90 to 95% of cases. Um, it is strongly dependent on the fuel source and a few other conditions, but generally there was enough of that present in a lot of the samples for it to be a potential for us to model with. In terms of the qualitative approach, what we decided was to um, treat exposure levels as either low, medium or high, depending on the total concentrations of marker compounds present in the samples. So rather than trying to um, use the model to give us a, an absolute number for smoke impact and its concentration, we were using the model to take all of the data and say, does it look like it's low, medium or high um, exposure um, evidence from smoke? This is the breakdown of the concentration levels we saw in the grapes. So um, with the, one thing I didn't mention with the quantitative modeling, um, we did see what appeared to be reasonable calibration models developed, but when we applied the independent test sets to those models, we found that, that we, we just didn't have the reliability and the accuracy that we'd like. So we very quickly moved to a classification model, looking at potential risk rating of low, medium or high. Um, that appeared to be a much more fruitful approach for us um, and gave us a much better chance of categorizing degree of impact from the smoke. So the, the histogram we see at the top of the screen is the glycoside concentration breakdown. You can see there's, there's quite a wide range um, in the samples we looked at. A lot at this sort of lower end 
Um, but even the stuff down at, you know, 100, 200 micrograms per kilogram, that potentially has, um, that can potentially impact on the sensory characters in the wine. So in terms of how we applied the risk rating, the, the low risk, we um, use the nominal value of 30 micrograms per kilogram for total glycosides. Um, and I've highlighted those in green here. So this is just a bit more of a, um, a detailed breakdown of the lower end of that concentration range. So there's still a lot of samples in that range, but they're, they're all pretty much within the expected range for background levels. If you remember from the graphs earlier, I think only Shiraz has total glycosides that exceed 30. So if something's in within this sort of concentration range, we would expect it to be fairly um, typical of, of background levels and, and therefore not indication of smoke being present. The medium level, which I've highlighted in orange, um, ranges between 30 and 100 micrograms per kilogram. So it's, it's in that range where we're over and above the background levels, and there is some indication that smoke may be present, but it's not significantly higher um, than the background levels. Um, with the high samples highlighted in blue, um, that's anything over 100 micrograms per kilogram. They, they weigh in excess of what we'd expect, and there's strong evidence in that set that um, smoke has been present. So you can see from the numbers here with grape samples down at the bottom, it's not a completely balanced model. There was a lot at that high end with very high concentrations. So in terms of having a robust model we can use going forward, that is um, something we'll need to address as we, as we go on. So this is the output we get from the model where we've used a classification technique. So the, on the top half of the screen, we've got the calibration set results. So essentially it's 100% it's accurate classification um, where we're looking at the predicted level of smoke exposure versus the actual level that we saw in the chemical data. The bottom half of the screen summarizes the, the validation set for this method. So this is us testing it against completely independent samples. So although the calibration set showed 100% classification, the actual level of accuracy we saw in the validation set was only around 70%. So we do have some false positives that I've highlighted in orange. So if, as an example, the actual level um, in some samples was low from the chemical data, our model predicted them as being medium or high. So that, that's a false positive, essentially. Um, but that's probably acceptable because the likely scenario would be that the fruit would undergo additional um, scrutiny, whether that's a small scale ferment or more elaborate chemical testing to actually quantify what the levels um, present are. Um, as I said before, the false negatives are a bigger issue for us because in this instance, on the right-hand side, we've got two samples that are actually high but being predicted as low. Um, they, they are a problem because potentially someone will see that and say, okay, I've got a high level of exposure. Um, I may not do anything else with that. Um, the fruit can't be used. Um, so there's always needs to be a consideration of, of, of an additional step just to sanity check what we see with this kind of modeling. Um, we did do some further work on these models to balance out the numbers across the low, medium and high categories. We were able to drop down this false negative rate somewhat, but it's certainly not perfect as it is. It needs more samples to be added to it so that that incidence can drop to zero and we can have more confidence in the, in the screening technique. Um, we did do some additional analysis on those two samples. Um, they're actually from the same vineyard. Um, we couldn't see anything obvious in the data we had to understand why they were providing a false negative, but there's obviously something in there chemically that's impacting on our ability to um, pick up the right level of smoke exposure. 
This is the data for the wines that we looked at. Again, we use the same category ratings as before. Um, the actual absolute levels in grapes and wine are quite similar. So low risk is less than 30, medium 30 to 100 and high anything above 100. Um, you can see in this instance, we actually had a lot more at the lower level. Um, and that's just a consequence of the samples we received um, in for analysis. Um, probably a lot more of the compounds that have been in there in glycoside form have potentially been transferred into the volatile form. And that's what we're seeing in some of this data at the low end. But again, we saw a big spread of data across the samples that we received. Um, the, you know, again, this medium range of exposure represents something like three to five times higher concentrations in glycosides compared with the background levels. So again, there's some evidence that the smoke exposure there, high levels, you know, they're, they're above that. So, you know, strong, strong indication there's been smoke present. Now the calibration set for wines actually looks good as well. Um, out of the almost 300 samples we had in that set, we had 100% classification success. The, the problem was in the test set because when we threw independent samples at it, um, we saw something around 55% accuracy. So it's performing to a degree, but it's certainly not given us the degree of accuracy we need. We've still got a lot of false positives and false negatives. It's certainly not as reliable as the great screening method that we developed. Um, so in terms of understanding the degree of smoke impact and having confidence in a rapid method, there's certainly, um, there's certainly more value and there's more benefit and there's more promise shown with the grape screening method. Um, and that's probably where we'd like that confidence to be is for producers to be able to screen grapes and not have to waste money either going through expensive analytical confirmation tests, sensory screening, making the wines and finding out that there's a lot of smoke there because it is a, a, an expensive and time consuming process to deal with from that point forward. So quickly as a wrap up, um, infrared does show a lot of promise for screening smoke affected samples, especially with the grapes. Um, I think once we've done some refining on these models, the classification models we've built can be used for preliminary screening of grapes um, and potentially wine samples as well. And if we can cer certainly reduce the incidence of false negatives from the method, then we can give people a bit more confidence that this kind of technique can be used. I think we, we certainly would want to do more work just to refine the models and put some more validation samples through it. Um, obviously to do that, we need smoke affected samples. And in an ideal world, we don't get any more, but we know that in Australia, there's an ongoing risk that that will happen. Um, when that time comes, we will do more work and, and aim to work more closely with industry to understand how we can transfer this method um, and get it adopted um, potentially on a regional basis or something like that for doing some initial stage screening of um, grapes where there is a risk of smoke exposure. Um, ultimately, I think you know, a combination of different rapid methods might be required. Um, I'd mentioned before, there's other parallel studies um, ongoing with other technologies. It may well be that we have to use a combination of these techniques to achieve a really robust method and to give us the confidence we need. Um, and have a reliable screening method that can be used. But there's certainly more work to be done and we will continue to build the models and look for opportunities to um, test those. So there's a few thanks on screen and all the producers that um, provided samples, everyone here at the Institute and other bodies that have supported the various components of these studies. I've um, talked through today. And that's me done, Jeff.
Thanks, Neil. It's uh, good to hear uh, what the results were um, from that rapid test. We've got a couple of questions um, and some more coming through, I see. So if anyone has a question, uh, please use the Q&A um, function uh, on the bottom of the toolbar and send that through and we'll go through them. Um, I'll do them in order though, because there's been some already. Uh, so we've got a question from Tasmania, Paul. Um, he has two questions. One, which is, um, should an international standard be developed for measuring smoke taint? Start with the big questions. Um, thank you for the question, Paul. Um, in an ideal world, we would have an international standard that everyone can use. Um, the issue with that is um, access to the right instrumentation. Um, it's all relatively expensive equipment and it all gives... I, I talked about the two methods before. It, both methods give valid data. And as long as you're using the same method to understand background levels and then look at trends over time, they're both fine. Um, the issue is comparing across the different methods. So yes, in an ideal world, we'd have a standard that everyone can work to and it would be absolutely the same, but the reality is it's hard to put that in place. And I think what we've got in place at the moment works as long as you consider the limitations of comparing data across different labs that are using different techniques. Okay, there was a second part to the question, which is really uh, asking uh, the interpretation data, um, is that published anywhere? So I'm not, I'm not sure if we're talking about the background levels. I think so, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I think, I think the data we've produced, you're probably quite well placed to answer this, Jeff, that has been published. Um, and there is ongoing work to update that. Like I said, we, are, we have been looking at other varieties this year um, through other studies, and we'll add those to what's already there. But that data has been published. Uh, Jeff, can you tell me where that is? Uh, yeah, so if it's on the Smoke Master page on the AWRI website. Um, we're reviewing all the uh, content well, continuously. Um, but if you go into the data and interpretation area, there's a link directly to the report um, uh, where it details the different levels. I think you've mentioned some of the levels in your webinar today. Um, so you could look at it, some of those slides as well. Um, but yeah, if you go, um, or even if you wanted to Google uh, Smoke AWRI, you'll get to the main page and it'll obviously be down there um, halfway through the screen. I think just in terms of the way the, the data is used, the background data with the interpretation, if, if you're using different labs, there will be some degree of differences in that background data. In the scheme of things, it's probably not that significant. You know, something's a fairly, you see like a low impact from smoke. You're going to see that with both methods. It's not like one will say it's low and one will say it's high. Um, there'll be some shades of gray in there. So where it will certainly allow you to understand the course differences. If, if you've got something that's on the border between, you know, maybe there's an indication of exposure, the two different methods may give you slightly different steers on where, which side of the fence they sit on. Okay, there's a few other questions coming through, so we'll go through them. Uh, Steve's got a question. Um, how far away are you from fine tuning um, this new rapid method? Um, just to remove the incidences of the false positives um, on the rapid tests, so uh, months, years, et cetera. Look, um, it's a hard one to answer because we're really reliant on having access to smoke affected samples. So we could, we could for instance, look to generate those ourselves, um, but generally we're reliant on what comes in from bushfires. So I would hope that, you know, when the next event hits and we know that it's a when, not if, um, that we would use that to um, refine the models. I would, I would hope that um, if we have a year where there are bushfire events, we should certainly be able to um, nail down the issue around false positives, oh, sorry, false negatives um, and remove those 
Um, the models have been really robust. It's just there's a couple of instances where they've fallen over and we haven't really had the time or the resources to go back and understand why. So those two samples I talked about before, they were from the same vineyard, same variety. We couldn't see anything in our data that gave us a clue as to why they were flagged as false positives, but um, th there's probably more work we can do in that space to understand that. Uh, we've got a couple of questions as well, uh, which you didn't touch on, but just the uh, rough cost or estimate of these, um, either um, the analysis itself or the machine as well, if people wanted to have their own machine. Yeah, look, there are some people in industry with this particular um, instrument. From memory, it's, um, you know, cost-wise, it's around you know, $20,000. So, the, you know, potentially bigger producers can maybe afford to have something like that, certainly not smaller producers. I think if we can get the method reliable and robust, we would look to um, utilise something on a, maybe on a regional basis we actually have two instruments here that we have loaned out to producers and regions before. So that is certainly an option. Um, like I say, if we can get the confidence up on the method, we could potentially deploy an instrument to a region that has a bushfire event and use that as a, an initial screening tool. And we could do that relatively quickly. So there's a couple of questions as well on the sample prep. Um, so what was it like uh, for this rapid method? And is it straightforward enough uh, so a grower can do it? Um, yeah, yeah. look, we, I mean, I didn't go into the detail, but we actually looked at two or three different methods during this period. Um, the infrared was the most, certainly the most promising. Um, I haven't talked about the others because they didn't really give us something viable. But um, the good thing about the infrared method was in comparison to the others, there really was no prep um, other than homogenization of the grapes. Um, so we didn't actually um, seek to um, clarify the sample at all. It was just a straight homogenous sample onto uh, a fairly small window on the IR and, and that, that's it. So there is no, there is no elaborate prep. Um, you could certainly deploy something like this in a um, you know, one receivable lab uh, so great receivable lab or um, you know, if you had power source, you could potentially do it in the vineyard, for instance. We're a few steps away from that, but that's not um, that's not that beyond this method. Yeah, that relates to another question from Frank. So he was um, thinking that if you couldn't do it in the vineyard or in the region, is it yeah, could could you produce all the samples, homogenize them and then just send smaller homogenous samples? for the analysis rather than frozen grapes. Yeah, look, um, as long as there's no plant health um, issues um, and you know, there's, there's processes in place to, to get the right certification around that, that, that's potentially something we can look at as well. We've already had discussions around um, faster ways we can um, process samples and get them analyzed here. Um, that, 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 that's definitely an option we can we can look at. We really don't need anything more than a few drops of homogenate, for instance, to do the test. So if, if we're just in rapid screening, that would be quick and easy. Um, I mean, if you're sending samples like homogenates for testing anyway, we could run the rapid screen. And if that suggests it's high impact, we then run the, the standard analytical tests. Okay, so there's a, I'll keep the technical ones coming and then address some of the others. Um, so what is the band in the FTIR peak uh, that's being used to quantitate the peak? Um, also, which compound is being used as the analyte for the FTIR study? Do you understand that, Neil? Yeah, look, um, so that's from Santosh. Uh, correct. Um, so the, the short answer is we're using the whole infrared spectrum. Now I've got data that I haven't shown that indicates where the, the most dominant bands are that are being used to model the, the concentration data. 
but um, there's actually quite a few sections in that spectral we're using for the modeling process. And we're not using a single compound with this, we're using the sum of the glycosides that are present in the samples. So as I said before, if we look at individual analytes, syringol GG aside, they're generally not there in high enough concentrations for us to be able to model um, reliably with this method. If we look at the total glycosides, we can get a pretty good classification model, um, but we're not looking at individual compounds. Okay, so then some um, more larger, bigger picture questions. Um, amongst all this uncertainty, what can winemakers do to mitigate um, these unwanted smoke or taint flavours? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. There's lots of answers to that one. Um, look, I think I, for anyone with this kind of question, I'd be um, reverting you to the smoke taint page on our website. There's lots and lots of information there. I certainly don't have enough time to go through all of that now. Um, there, are, there are some reme remediation methods that can be used um, with wines. There are some mitigation strategies that can be used in the winemaking process to reduce the impact or potential impact. Um, and there are specific sensory methods we've developed that can be used to um, rapidly screen the potential impact that we've seen. There are ongoing studies as well um, to understand if there's any technologies out there that can be used. Um, you know, I've talked about activated carbons briefly before. There's um, enzymatic treatments that can be used. Um, you know, there's a lot of suppliers out there suggesting that they've got the, the silver bullet. Um, I'm not sure that we've seen something that, that works across the board, but there are things you can do to improve the situation. I, I would look at the smoke um, webpage for, to direct you to the right information for that. Yeah, so just on that, I suppose there's um, there's a lot of work still currently being done from the fires um, uh, in 29 and 20, um, and that work continues as those results come to hand and uh, findings are released. Uh, we'll add those links to the smoke tanked um, a, a summary of the work and or a link to the paper, um, and also uh, cross-linking over to the Wine Australia smoke tank web pages as well. So um, check those out because they are updated quite regularly. Um, there's another question as well from Sandrine also on recommendations for how best to sample a vineyard. And I'd probably, you can answer it new if you'd like, but again, that question's addressed um, in one of the fact sheets on the web page. Um, which tells you uh, the best way to, um, in terms of getting a representative sample uh, for your vineyard or the, a collection of vineyards in that space. Um, um, there was also another technical questions on the GCMS analysis. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure of, of hyd hydrolocytes. Um, I'm not sure if that's talking about just the volatiles or the glycosides. Uh, Neil, have you got... Any comment on that? Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure where that question's um, looking at. I mean, the the GCMS. If you're talking about the GCMS um, that's used on the back of the hydrolysis method, then that can be used to quantify the the volatiles that are left when the sugars have been cleaved. But as I said, it doesn't tell you which sugar molecules they were attached to in the first place. So it will give you an indication of what's there. Um, and the numbers are generally in a similar ballpark, but that, that's part of the problem in trying to compare data across different labs because you don't know the true source of those volatiles you're measuring by the hydrolysis method. It's very hard to make those comparisons. But if you do all your analysis that way, it's probably fine. Okay, if anyone's got any more questions, um, send them through. I can't see any coming through. Um, so if that's the case, uh, I'd just like to thank Neil for his time today, sharing um, the, the latest results of that new analysis and the rapid test that you were um, talking about today. Um, also, I would like to thank everyone um, attending today. Um, I'm sure they got a lot out of um, the session and obviously the questions and, and smoke and smoke taint, I suppose, remains quite still front of mind to, uh, to a lot of us.
Um, so just to remind you again that you'll get a link to a recording of this session and that will be linked onto the ABRO's YouTube channel um, if you'd like to listen to it afterwards. Um, also would like to acknowledge Wine Australia uh, for providing the funding uh, for the extension uh, project to host um, and hold these webinars. Uh, the next ABRO webinar is on the 16th of September. Uh, we're going to have Liz Pitcher, and she will um, discuss organic and sustainable uh, wine production. Um, if you'd like to register for this webinar, uh, please visit the Adabra website under the webinar section. Uh, thank you all again. Uh, stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you at the next Adabra webinar.